Today's word comes to us from the New Testament and the epistles. This is Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. This is chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. It's on page 933 of your pew Bibles. I will be reading the same version as that. This is the New Revised Standard Version. And this is one body with many members. Hear the word of the Lord. As I went to the wrong one, my apologies. This is spiritual gifts. I got a little ahead of myself. <laughs> now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters. I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one is speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in anyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit to utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, work of miracles. To another, prophesy. To another, discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Holy friends, for the next several weeks, we are going to be taking apart the book of 1 Corinthians. As you will notice, the altar cloth has changed from when you saw it last week. Last week it was white, and now it is green, symbolizing we have changed into a new season of the Christian year. We are in the season known as After the Epiphany. It's not a very exciting name. Neither is Ordinary Time. But this is our time to remind ourselves, just as the altar is green, this is our time to begin harvesting, or not harvesting, to begin sowing, right? Just as the grass is green and we till it up and we start putting seeds into the ground, this is our time to prepare for the next season, which will be Lent. But friends, we're going to spend most of this season in the book of first corinthians so i don't want to get super deep and kind of make this big broad statement about corinthians today because next week we're going to go right where we left off this is what we would call a semi-continuous reading for the next couple of weeks so why corinthians why are we starting in corinthians and what can we gather from corinthians today as you know paul wrote or went to corinth which was a famous city and started this church. It's one of the first churches he started, as you read in the book of Acts. And Corinth is a fascinating city when you compare it to the other ones. Corinth was a port city. It was one that led trade from, you know, the Silk Road, basically, from the Indian Peninsula to the Near East to the Roman Empire. It was smack dab in the, you know, the Aegean Sea. It allowed people to go and get goods from wherever they needed to where they had to go. It was full of people from all over the known world who maybe moved there and were so overwhelmed by the grandeur of what they saw that they wanted to stay. We have different nationalities, different cultures, different faiths, all living in this place of Corinth. And what makes Corinth interesting is that it's one of the few cities that kept its autonomy from the Roman government. Basically how they saw it was as long as you pay your taxes, you guys can do whatever you want. And Corinth was blessed by that in an interesting way. See, I think about Corinth a lot as I think about a large city that we would have today, similar to Los Angeles or New York City, right? There's a bunch of people gathered together who all have different ideas, but you can find little pockets of, like little cliques, if you will, right? These little pockets of people who believe one thing and act a certain way and have their own little culture that they're trying to build. And that's what we see in Corinth. In Corinth. We have this opposition between Christians who are beginning to understand the word of the Lord. And in Corinth, a lot of those Christians were pagans at one point, or what we would classify as pagans today. Those are peoples that didn't believe in Yahweh. They weren't Jews that became Christians. These are people who had you know, raised with a polytheistic worldview, which is the idea of many gods. Basically, if you need something, there's a specific God that does it. You pray to them, you do the rituals, and then that God may or may not take care of you depending on how they're feeling that day. So this church is a little different than the other churches. 
as we see with Romans, as we see with Galatians, as we even see with Ephesians, a lot of those are Jewish communities that became Christians. With Corinth, we have non-Jewish communities trying to sort out and figure out where does Jesus fit in their world? Unfortunately, I see a lot of parallels to modern-day America as I do with Corinth, and that's why we're going to spend a whole lot of time in Corinthians. The biggest thing for me is why are we here in the middle of chapter 12? Because if you look at it, it's sandwiched between two very interesting things. If you go back, chapter 11 is about head coverings, about women wearing shawls over their heads, as well as the institution of the Lord's Supper, how they're messing up this sacrament. And then we have this weird thing about gifts, and then later on, we're going to have a chapter that most of us know. It is the gift of love. Many of us have heard that chapter when we get into weddings. It's one that's very common at that time. So what does that mean for chapter 12? How come it's sandwiched between head coverings and tradition and the gift of love? Because as I mentioned, Paul is a very linear writer. As you continue to read him, he'll go, this is what I want to say. This is why it's true, and this is why the next point is. It's almost like chapter by chapter you have this section that he's willing to talk about. It's almost like he wrote it on a parchment, he was done, got a new piece of paper, sent that one out, and had it organized and sectioned. So, all the history aside, let's talk about what we're talking about today. You see, the trouble that we ran into with the head coverings and the Lord's Supper is that people were taking what was holy and making it what was better for themselves. For example, the head coverings that we're talking about are women that would be wearing these coverings that were very elaborate and were very beautiful and were seen as a status symbol, right? You know, I think about the same thing when we think about dressing our best for church. When some people dress their best for church, they're not doing it to please God. They're doing it to show how they look better than others. Because friends, let me be abundantly clear when it comes to how we dress when it comes to church. I simply ask that you are clothed, and I believe the the Lord our God would say the same. Let's not talk about when King David danced around the temple naked, because I'm pretty sure we don't want to do that. But God has called us to come as we are, humble, willing to accept his grace and peace, and to build our lives upon the rock of Jesus the Christ. So that's the first trouble they're having. They're seeing church as kind of this social contest on how they can do what the rest of the world is doing, which we'll get to when we get to the gifts. The second part is about the Lord's Supper, which we find that greed has made its way into the church. Their way of the Lord's Supper was very different than what we do today. When we have the Lord's Supper, we have, you know, we have a little cup out there, and we've got sliced up bread, and it's all together. They had what's called a love feast, a literal feast once a week that Christians would come together and set everything up. There was wine, there was food, it was a great time. But then they found that people who had nothing better to do were showing up and eating everything and drinking everything. And by the time people who were working, who needed a nice meal, were able to go to the love feast, it was all gone. They just had a bunch of drunk people yelling and arguing and laughing with one another because they had gotten what they wanted. Which, again, Christ tells us, we truly will get what we sow. We will reap what we sow. So now we're finally into the spiritual gifts. This is why Paul set up all this way. He's saying that the people are focused on status and they're focused on greed instead of focusing on what God has given to them. And he says it plainly in the first two verses where he says, when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray by idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one, by this, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Friends, As we are disciples, some of y'all might be looking around and thinking about what you want to do after service, what you have to prepare for, what you have to get ready for, what we're going to do this or that, making a bunch of what-ifs in our brains. It's easy to get led astray sometimes when there's worry, when there's uncertainty. Because as people, we really like to cling on to what we can. We like to make our own ways and our own navigations of life. But God has shown us multiple times He has plans for us. He reminds us each and every day to be grateful for what we have, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. But sometimes those idols are very enticing, as it says, once we were pagans. I think as well, friends, none of us were born Christians. 
We were given to God by the grace of our Father. But sometimes we tend to forget that because the world is loud. The world is annoying. The world has flashing lights that tell us you can get a new car today with zero down payments or whatever, right? We get focused on nice and shiny things that we forget what we're called to do, to use the gifts that God has given to us. And this is before what we're going to talk about next week, which is the the sizing of gifts, right? How we tend to think that some gifts are better than others. But what Paul is beginning to say is that we all have different gifts. He's not talking about the value of that. He's saying that we all have different gifts. And that made me think about a season that we just passed, which is Christmas. As a matter of fact, my family just had Christmas yesterday, believe it or not. It's just how the schedule worked. We all got together and we all shared gifts. And that's what makes today the same thing as December 26th. I would like to call it National Refund Day, where we spent so much time and effort finding that perfect gift for our loved ones, only to have them stand in the customer service line until they can return it and get money. Holy friends, God has given us so many gifts, yet we don't use them for his glory. We consider them worthless. We consider them not possible for God's work. But friends, God's kingdom is vast. Just like any kingdom, think about the jobs that we take here in the United States. We all don't have the same job, and that's really useful. Could you imagine if we were all bankers, or we were all lawyers, or we were all whatever you want to be? Not a lot would get done, because we all would be doing the same thing. God has called us with our gifts to experiment, to try to see how God's glory can be shown through whatever we have, especially the things that we don't consider worthwhile. For example, cooking. We take it for granted sometimes when we have the ability to cook. Maybe we'll be able to make a pot of soup before the, stu- before the snow starts. But friends, not everyone will have that luxury. We have brothers and sisters who eat out of cans. We have brothers and sisters who don't have any extra food at all. They were prepared for just a normal week when we don't know what's going to happen in the future, my holy friends. These gifts seem so small, but they are absolutely powerful. Now, friends, as we begin to close this sermon, I'll have to add a little bit of an illustration because it's just, it's, it's stuck in my head. And as you all know, with small children, small children really like Disney, right? Mm-hmm. And as you'll know, if you have children who are sick or bored and they just want to sit around and watch Disney, which means that I have to sit around and watch Disney. <laughs> and when they find a new Disney movie comes out, that's what you're watching over and over and over again. And I love the movie that just came out recently. I'm not going to spoil it, of course, but it's called Encanto. It's about a family in Colombia that was escaping persecution, and they were given a magical gift of a candle, which led to a magical home that allowed them to build a community around them. All of the children of this family are given magical gifts, whether it is shape-shifting or magical strength, or one of them has the literal ability to heal injuries based on the food that she cooks. Now, friends, this can go two very different directions. One direction that it could go is you can use that all for yourself. If somebody's very strong, they can push and bully and pick up whatever they want without ever worrying what other people will do. If you had the ability to heal, you could put a price tag on that. You could use it for yourself to benefit only you. But what the family in Encanto does is they build a community. As soon as they were given this home and these gifts, people started flocking to them. And instead of keeping them to themselves, despite having a home on a high tower, which most of us would think, at least in me and my literary brain, that they're tucked away, you're not supposed to see them, they're like your ever-benevolent lord that is watching over you, waiting to inflict justice and wrath. But no, the family lives in the community. The family goes out and helps the small community in every single little thing that they have, whether it's the family lost a donkey or one of them had an allergic reaction to bees. Friends, that's a true gift for us about how often the gifts that we have we do not share with the world. We're very eager to live in the world of America. We're very eager to live in the world that we have been given, which is as long as I have a home, I have a family, I've got a dog, I've got a picket fence, I've got a job and a car, Everything's great. The problem is that's a whole lot of eyes. I this, I that. Christ is calling us through Paul to remind ourselves that it is we 
The kingdom of God is we and us. Friends, it's up to us, especially this week and every day, to look out for those who may not have enough. When we have been given so many gifts, it's up to us to be generous with what God has given us. Once again, we are not called to be as pagans are. We are not called to focus on this world, on the rich and shiny things that will rot, that will rust, and will decay, my friends. We are called to focus on what is important, the gifts that God has given us, whether they are, as it says in the book of Corinthians, prophecy, mercy, spirit of discernment, Friends, we all have gifts to share. Let's be generous with what we have, with our community and with our world. Amen? Amen. Praise be to God in the highest, my righteous and holy friends.